Hey there. So um, we're going to continue with the second part of the vision topic. And this is again, visual sensation. So um, without need for further introduction, let's pick it up where we left off. Last time we finished up by talking about those retinal ganglion cells, but perhaps we were getting a little bit ahead of ourselves as far as these edge detection things are concerned, because we didn't really finish talking about the rods and the cones. So <clears throat> when it comes to how we actually see color, it is as always with these things, a little bit complicated. So let's take a look. When I say here, responding to the EM spectrum, EM is for electromagnetic. And that is what we consider all forms of light waves. So this includes visible light being the colors of the rainbow, if you will, but also includes thus invisible forms of light listed here as radio waves, infrared, ultraviolet X-rays and gamma rays. You don't need to know about all those other ones. We're only going to concern ourselves with the visible light spectrum. Um, another thing to orient you to what we're looking at here, you'll see that there is this color chart going from reddish to purple. And we see that beneath that, there are these decreasing numbers of 700 NM all the way down to 400 or maybe even 350 NM. That stands for nanometers. Uh, so very, very small version of a meter. And what this measurement is, is the wavelength, oops, sorry, the wavelength of light. So shorter wavelength light will look more purplish. And then the longer wavelength light will look more reddish. And that's how the visible light spectrum usually goes. So we'll see in a bit why like this wavelength thing means a little bit to us. Generally, I'm not too concerned with like, oh, what color is a specific wavelength? Uh, for this class at least. So we won't concern ourselves with that or necessarily the range of what human vision is. We don't need to know the beginning and end points. Just that this is the way that we measure the spectrum in nanometers. And so each nanometer measurement corresponds to a very, very specific shade of color. And here is what's going on inside our retina. So when we are looking at the level of rods and cones, before we even get to the retinal ganglion cells and all that other stuff. This is how they respond. So again, on our X axis, we have the wavelength of light and we know that, that corresponds to specific visible colors. The different cones are named as such because they respond to different colors. So the short cone is for blue, medium cone is for green and long cone is for red. Now, you don't have to know the names of short, medium and long, just blue, green, and red cones will be fine. And we get the specific curve responses that they give. We'll talk about rods in a second, but the thing here is that these, like other things we see in the class so far, are response curves. These response curves are basically telling us, oh, how much is this photoreceptor going to respond to this color or that color? So there is a very specific shade of blue that the blue cone responds best to. There's a very specific shade of green that the green cone responds best to. And unfortunate for its name, there's this very specific shade of like yellowish that red cones respond best to. So that isn't to say that they only respond to one singular shade of the color. We see based on the response curve that they can respond to other colors that are not their ideal. They just don't respond as well to them. So the red cone, for instance, has a really large response curve. In the case of these response curves, <clears throat> we see that even though red responds best to something in the yellowish uh, range, it still responds like halfway to things that are in the blue green area or things that are in the deep red ish area. 
Blue cones, for instance, also will respond to things that are, even if it gives a very minimal response, it still responds a little bit to things that are green. So any single cone would not be sufficient in order to give us a full idea of color. The brain needs to actually have all three cones working in online to figure out what something is. So if somebody were shown this sort of sky blue band here, then as long as they have all three cones, the brain can do the math. The blue cone will be this much active, like about halfway. The green cone will be about halfway active. And then the red cone will be not at all active. So by taking these three different variables, the blue cone having half activity, the green cone having half activity, and the red cone having zero activity, the brain is able to figure out where on the color spectrum the color belongs that we're seeing. If we only had two cones, the brain ends up missing some information. So if we have something like, oh, it's in the light blue area and we get blue cone tells us half activity, green cone tells us half activity, red cone isn't there. So we might be able to figure out light blue, but we might have a lot of problems trying to discern other colors, especially things that are like greenish or certain shades of green. So let's say that we're all, all the way out at like greenish yellow, about where the red and green cones cross over, okay? So let's say this person lacks the red cones. They only have blue, blue and green. So if we go all, all the way to like yellowish green, blue, it's not even able to detect it. So that's out of the equation. Green, okay, it's like at like 80 to 75% active. That's great. But then if we don't have the red cone, we don't know where this falls on that one spectrum. So the green cones basically are our only piece of information there. It's like telling us that, well, it could be yellowish green because it's probably not on the other end here because the blue cone's not responding, but it doesn't really precisely know exactly what color it is. All this example is to get at the key point here that when people lack or have a dysfunctional version of one of these three cones, their ability to discriminate colors goes down. In other words, colors are less distinct to them. They see a smaller range of colors, so they do not see the typical rainbow. Instead, they see something that we'll see in another slide. So based on what we've seen here, would you say that rods and cones strictly use labeled line coding based on how we described it in the last segment? Why or why not? That aside, I didn't go over rods in here, so I might as well mention them now. Rods do respond best to things in the bluish green light area, but it, we can see that they kind of go across this entire area as far as what they respond to. So if we were to try to see things in a low light condition, if the lighting is of a bluish green nature, we're going to see things better than if the low light condition is only lit by reddish hues. So color blindness, when we're lacking one of those three cones. First, before we get into what color blindness is, this whole idea that we have three cones that correspond to three spectrums of color, uh, we call this the trichromatic theory. There are other theories of how vision works, but this is one that we have like a really clear uh, biological evidence for. So here again are our color curves. Now, if we are missing one of those cones, then the brain has less information to do the math with to figure out exactly what color we're looking at. And that results in the following. So when we look at this diagram to the right, we see what the normal range of color is that somebody sees. If we see that somebody's lacking in a red cone or a green cone, that they result in very similar deficits. We see that basically their color spectrum is smeared out, where they will see certain colors in replacement of something like green or red, but a lot of the other colors that are more certain become a lot more smeared out. So blue, for instance, takes up way too much of the spectrum. Yellow takes up too much of the spectrum. And then we have these sort of like hazy in-betweens that these people perceive. 
if somebody in contrast is missing the blue cone and not the red or green cone, this is what they see, which is almost like an inverse of everything. So we can see all sorts of weird things, but the key point is that when somebody has partial color blindness, when they're only lacking one of the three cones, or when one of the three cones is damaged or mutated or something else like that, it doesn't make the color cone, uh, the color that's supposed to correspond to gray. Instead, it just makes all the colors less distinct. So red does not become gray automatically. Green does not become gray automatically. It just makes the range of color somebody can perceive less uh, distinguishable. So if somebody with these types of color blindness will have a lot of trouble trying to distinguish between different shades of green, for instance. Now, I mentioned here that this is, typically this is a sex-linked inherited mutation. So uh, men are more likely to get this since they'll only have one copy of the gene for these different types of cones, whereas women will um, have two copies. And so one might still be functional and they'll be able to see normally. If they have two mutant copies, then that would be when they do not have uh, the ability to see color using that cone. Um, with men, because we have X and Y chromosomes, the color cone information, the gene does not exist on the Y chromosome. So that's why we only have one copy, whereas with females, we have two X chromosomes. So there's potential for two copies. Either one of them being functional will be sufficient. Okay, so um, actually before I go back, here's a question for you all, and you could ask this again of me in lecture. When we look at what vision looks like for people that have defective red cones, and then we look at how vision is like for people that have defective green cones, we see that they're really similar. Why do you think it is that they see similar ranges of color if the cones are supposed to be separate lines of communication. Moving on. If we were to look at the information going up through our visual pathway, the information that our cones provides us looks something like this. It doesn't look particularly helpful because we're missing things like yellow, green seems a little bit more indistinct, and so on. When information is forwarded to the lateral geniculate nucleus, that spot in the thalamus, that relay area, it starts to reorganize some of the color input and make more sense of it. And then finally, once we're up in our primary visual areas, then we actually have the full color spectrum at our axis. And so it begs the question, how do we perceive more colors than what the cones actually allow for? Because if this is all the information the cones allow for, how is it that we get more color extracted from that somehow? Well, there is another process theory of vision, the opponent process theory. When we talked about retinal ganglion cells, we talked about the center on versus surround off type of thing. And we kind of thought of it like a black versus white situation. However, not all of these opposing uh, things, these opposing process uh, things are black and white. In this diagram below, we see that we have different types of retinal ganglion cells that do the same thing with colors opposing colors in particular. So there are those that have a blue on uh, center and a yellow off surround type of situation, or vice versa, a yellow on center or a blue off surround. And so these combinations of retinal ganglion cells will give us an idea of where certain colors are distinct. We'll have the same thing for red and green, and then again, black and white. So this is kind of interesting because it'll give us an idea of which colors are opposing, and then it will give our brain a little bit more math to work with. So we look at, this is what's coming in from the retina, these are the retinal ganglion cells, it gets reorganized somewhere in the LGN, but once it gets to the primary visual cortex, this is basically what the brain can be receiving. So certain levels of activity will say, oh, it's this color or that color. If the level of activity is increased in some spots, it'll see red. If it's decreased in other spots, it might be blue or green, and so on and so forth. Let's take a look at what this practically might mean, though. The way that we have evidence for the opponent process theory is that 
if we are exposed to one particular color for a prolonged period of time, when we suddenly remove that color, our eyes have to de-adapt. So, um, <clears throat> hold on one second. So when we are trying to stare at something that's like a red screen for a while, or let's say we were in a room with red lighting, then after we've been in there for like, I don't know, I'd say like a little while, maybe about five minutes, if we go to another room, there might be this sort of uh, feeling like when it's regular lighting, it's looking more green because red and green oppose each other. So one example of this, uh, I knew somebody in college who had one of these red lanterns and that was his only sort of source of light in his uh, dormitory room at nighttime. And after he'd been working there for a long time, he'd wander out into the hallway uh, with white walls and he would just sort of remark on how everything seemed green for a little bit. And so this is because the retinal ganglion cells that kind of adapt to being constantly bombarded with red light so that when we suddenly take that aw away, they have to de-adapt. And then as they're de-adapting, we are seeing green light in their place, the opposing color, the opposite color. You can also see some examples of this sort of saturation effect here. So take a look at this link uh, in this um, video. So there are some midway summary points I want to mention. These include things from the last video clip. Key points, photoreceptors decrease their firing when exposed to light, not increase. So it's a bit counterintuitive. This decrease in firing leads to decrease in neurotransmitter output. This lack of neurotransmitter output can have either excitatory or inhibitory effects, depending on some of those in between cells and what happens at the ganglion cells. Um, these kind of create those center on versus off surround situations in the retinal ganglia cells. Color cones have a response curve. The opponent process theory will show us that there are certain cells that oppose each other as far as what color they respond to. And as we've seen a few examples so far, vision is not entirely absolute. Instead, there are a lot of things based on Okay, so now we are escaping from the eye. We are going into other regions. And some of these other regions we've seen in the sheep brain lab and elsewhere. So looking at this, we see that the visual pathway splits information in a really eccentric kind of way. And so information that is in the left field of view. So when you are looking at a wall, things that are on the left side of that wall, going to both eyes, and talk to the right hemisphere of the brain. Things that are on the right side of that wall talk to the left hemisphere of the brain. So be sure not to confuse this because even though it sounds like there's a crossover, the crossover only applies to what is in visual space in front of you. In other words, outside of your body, whatever you're looking at, that is the visual space. It is not a crossover what happens into each eye. So it is not one of these situations where left eye uh, information goes all to right brain, right eye information goes all to left brain. We can see in this diagram that it actually splits. And instead it's more based on what we see in our visual field that gets sent to the opposite hemisphere. So again, left visual field goes to right brain, right visual field goes to left brain. And this is regardless of which eye it actually goes in through, that both eyes do the switcheroo to the opposing hemisphere. We see that there are a lot of stops along the way. So first we've got going out of the eyes, optic nerve to optic chiasm, going to optic tract. And by the time we get to optic tract, that's where the information has finally been collected into one hemisphere. Uh, so the split or the crossover is complete. We're not gonna worry about pulvinar nucleus, but we do see familiar player lateral genicular nucleus here. We see a small off branch of our vision going to here where it says superior colliculus, one of the other places that we talked about 
in our sheep brain lab that I'll mention again in a bit. And finally, out of the LGN, it goes to the primary visual cortex. If somebody were to receive damage to the reddened area of the primary visual cortex here, this would cause them to not be able to see anything in their left visual field. So when there's damage to the right-sided red blob in the back of the brain here, they basically become blind in both eyes to the left visual field. They're, in other words, their visual field is constrained to only what's on the right side of space. Now, as far as information going to either hemisphere, the information does get collected together and there is crosstalk between the two hemispheres of the brain using the big fiber track that connects the hemispheres, the corpus callosum. Later on in this course, we'll see why that collection of information matters because some things only occur on one side of the brain or the other side of the brain. For instance, our uh, vision of things that are parts and pieces is kind of a left side of the brain thing. Our vision of uh, more of the whole of things or faces, that's a right side of the brain thing. So when the two hemispheres can't communicate, so if the corpus callosum is severed in some way, that's when we start seeing some interesting issues with vision. As for the info that's sent to that superior colliculus stop off, uh, or SC for short, this is concerned with location information. So in the visual perception chapter, we are going to be talking about how there are different pathways in the brain that help us determine where things are. But even before the information gets to those pathways, there are some early stops along the way that start detecting where things are. And you might be wondering, why is it kind of stopping off early? Well, the superior colliculus has an important process in how it actually controls what we're looking at directly. So the SC, will start providing activity before eye movements are uh, happening. So if there's something happening in the periphery of our vision, so the edge of our vision, then the superior colliculus might start firing a lot. And then after the firing is done, the eyes will move toward whatever was in the periphery. So it then lands in the center of our vision when we look directly at it. So question for you. Why is it that superior colliculus will fire before eye movement rather than during eye movement toward this sudden thing that's popped up in our vision? The superior colliculus is kind of interesting because basically it's kind of helping us detect stuff. Uh, this is not an answer to the prior question. Do let me know if you have trouble trying to answer it. So that's a question for you. But um, the, the superior colliculus does put together information about visual and auditory stuff, so hearing related material sounds. And it's really useful for helping us orient to stimuli that are in our periphery or off to the side, especially things that could be very startling stimuli. So things that we want to have immediate information about so they don't continue to surprise us or to assess whether they're threatening or not. So the superior colliculus basically is giving us this heads up long before our other visual centers in the brain have finished processing much information about details of the visual scene. So again, the superior colliculus will kind of help prep our eyes to look at things that are of importance or of threat, even before the brain is able to start linking together ideas of what threat is or what the details are. This diagram uh, revisits the idea of what happens when we mess with the pathway in vision. Now, what makes it a little bit more confusing is, and I know I have this uh, graphic changed in another class's uh, diagram. Instead of it being left and right split here, imagine that the visual scene is such that it looks more like this, where there's a screen far away from both eyes and the left is red, the right is blue in the case of this diagram here. So a person is looking at a screen and the left side is red and the right side of the screen is blue. In both eyes, left and right eye, they will get the same sort of split. The lens of the eye gives a little flipperoo here. Um, 
And then this allows for the information to be collected and transferred so that things in the blue side of the screen on the right go to the left side of the brain and things on the right side of the screen on the left go to the right side of the brain. If we were to make a cut behind the left eye, then we're just blind from that eye. That kind of makes sense. We, if we can't send information from the left eye, then we are blind for that eye. If we cut part of the optic nerve coming out of the left eye, we might lose half of the visual scene for just that eye, okay? Seems to make sense so far. Cutting it at the optic chiasm can result in a really weird thing where only the information that needed to cross through the optic chiasm that wasn't just being sent to the same hemisphere, only that information gets lost from each eye. And we have a scenario three here. We don't need to worry about that too much, but just sort of something interesting to know. If we were to have damage higher up in the process, like damage at the lateral geniculate nucleus on one side of the brain, so left side in this case, or damage in the primary visual cortex in one side of the brain, uh, the left side in this case, we end up losing out on that part of our field of view in both cases on the right side of space. So the blue side of the screen will be gone from our vision. Now, when I say gone, it just means that our vision is constrained only to what's visible on the left side, the red side of the screen. So going back to the top here, the left side here. It doesn't mean that we can't ever perceive the other side. We just have to move our eyes. Uh, basically, if we were to imagine what this is like, it would be like putting blinders over our eyes, but not over the entire eye, just over a half of the eye. So one half of the eye could see around it, the other half could not. To kind of illustrate what I'm talking about here, I'll just do a little bit of camera action. So it would be the equivalent of, rather than covering, covering up both eyes completely, it would be the equivalent of putting up a blinder so that we would have both eyes covered on the same side. So if I were to do this like this, it would be like putting a cover over both eyes like so. So I could see out of the, same side on both eyes and that's what damage to one hemisphere is like that you're still seeing the half here but then the other half is blocked out the same thing applies for over here so people with those blinders on would know okay in order to see more i just need to move around with my limited field of view so really what's happening is that having this damage just constrains how much we can actually see. Uh, it doesn't change fundamentally what we're capable of seeing. Like it doesn't stop a person from being able to see the blue side of the screen if they just turn their head. So it becomes in their new field of view, their constrained field of view. Let me know if this is unclear at all. We can kind of run over it in class. Once we exit the retina, before we get to the primary visual cortex, we have to talk about the LGN, this lateral geniculate nucleus. This is a part of the thalamus, the central relay station of the brain. And there are two main cell types, parvocellular, translating to small cells. And these are for discriminating color, form, details. Basically, this takes information from the cones. And then, hold on a second. Realize I didn't turn on screen share. So let me do that one more time. All right. So parvocellular, small cells, they're used for color, detail, form information. Uh, basically, that's our cone information. Magnocellular in the LGN, uh, those are for edge detection and movement, that stuff that comes from rocks. And so we kind of see a clear split already of things that are really important for telling us what something is, part of cellular stuff, and other cells that tell us, tell us about where something is or where it's going, the magnocellular cells. And this is what it looks like when we split them together. Within one LGN, it'll actually have splits between uh, the eyes. So it'll have left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, right eye, left eye. And so this way we actually have divisions between the eyes even within this area. Because again, remember that within one side of the brain is taking in information from the opposite side of the visual field 
but that opposite side of the visual field comes in through both eyes. So it begs the question, is it just a relay station for reorganizing stuff, or does it edit the information at all? where it sends it to our primary visual cortex called V1. So let's take in some ideas here. Uh, one thing that the LGN is influenced by is, quote, the state of arousal. This is not sexual arousal. This is sleep versus wakefulness kind of arousal. And so if we are asleep, then it is going to affect the LGN's activity, take in less stuff, send less stuff to the brain. There are inputs that come from the superior colliculus that also influence the LGN as far as how it processes information. And both of these kind of have to relate to attention and what we decide to focus on. So I would say the LGN does edit the information a little bit, especially when we consider looking at the diagram a few steps back. It seems to edit color information as well. So. Taking a look at this second bar here, we see that the LGN has already extracted more color than the cones can do alone. So that tells us that the LGN does indeed edit some information, even before sending it up to our big processing area in V1, primary visual cortex. So then we escape from the LGN and go to that primary visual cortex. This is called V1. Um, sometimes in the literature, you'll see it called striate cortex, which is different from extra striate, which means outside of V1. Uh, some people refer to this as Broadman area 17. We're just going to call it V1 for short. Let's keep it simple. For every primary cortex in the brain, by the way, there will be this kind of abbreviation. So for the hearing center of the brain, the primary auditory cortex, that would be A1. For the touch zone of the brain, primary somatosensory cortex, it would be S1. And even for a movement, the primary motor cortex is called M1. So there is a somewhat intuitive naming system to this. So the LGN sends this information here, and it uses what we call retinotopic mapping, meaning it will have a map of what falls onto the retina. In other words, how an image falls onto the retina or the back of our eye and it tries to conserve and match that image and splay it out onto the cortex here. So if we are showing a person in both eyes, the left eye and the right eye, this sort of image, this is what the image looks like below. And if we're looking at these circles, what happens in the circle that has one in it is effectively the stuff that we're looking directly at, stuff that's in our phobia, our center of field of view. The stuff that's in two and three, uh, in both cases, that will be stuff that is more out into the periphery. Now, looking at the diagram at the top here, we see that the division of labor is that, okay, there's one really back part that's dedicated to area one in the visual field. There's another uh, back part that's not so far back dedicated to area two, and then there's another part for area three. You should notice that there's a mismatch in sizing here. Despite the circle for one being so small, there is the largest amount of brain area devoted to processing that number one area. So it is a case of cortical magnification. Cortical meaning cortex, magnification meaning it's magnifying the amount of processing in brain real estate that is devoting towards what it's trying to see. So because it's in the center of our view, because we have the most detailed vision for what we look at in the center of our view, this is made possible by the fact that we have such an exaggerated amount of brain area, brain volume for processing the stuff in the center of our field of view. In contrast, the stuff that's more out in the periphery, despite the periphery areas two and three being so much larger in our vision, we don't have as high detail vision there, so there's less processing volume, less brain real estate devoted to either of those circles. As for what V1 does, it doesn't see a map of different pixels and dots. 
it already is starting to try to reconstruct things. An important aspect of how, how visual sensation works is that it will take an image and it will break it down into dots like pixels on a screen monitor. And then it will start to reconstruct them into lines and shapes, complex shapes, and then finally recognizable objects. So the visual cortex doesn't see things as dots and pixels. At this point, it's already putting those dots and pixels together into something meaningful. It is sensitive to lines, specifically lines that are at certain tilts and sizes and movements. And this looks something like this. So when we take all those retinal ganglion cells with their center on, off, surrounds, let's say a line falls across a bunch of those retinal ganglion cells. So all the centers are being turned on and not too much of the surround is turning those cells off. This group of retinal ganglion cells, let's say that there are about seven of them where each of these pluses are, this group of retinal ganglion cells can talk to one cell within V1, our primary visual cortex. And so as long as all of them are talking to that V1 cell, then it can get the V1 cell to respond. So if it's a perfect vertical line and this V1 cell gets their input from all these retinal ganglion cells arranged in a vertical line, the V1 cell will give its best response, it's the most action potentials or the most on switches that it can while this line is being displayed. If we start to tilt that line a bit, less of it falls on our strip of retinal ganglion cells. So some of the middle ones will get some of the line on them, but then the edge ones will lose it because of the tilt. So it won't set off the V1 cell quite as well as it could, so it gives fewer action potentials. If we do a completely horizontal line, where basically it's falling in very few of any of the center area here, our excitatory region, then we don't get much of any response. And if we were to map these responses of this specific V1 cell, we see that impulses per second just means how many times does it turn on per second. And that just means how ideal is the stimulus to what this neuron is looking for. So the bigger the impulses, uh, the, sorry, the more the impulses, the more close to ideal this stimulus is to what this neuron wants. So this neuron, this V1 neuron, wants a perfectly vertical line. This is the maximum that it'll respond. If we tilt the line in either direction to less and less vertical, it too responds less and less. Until we get to the point where the line is horizontal, it does not respond at all. So that's one type of V1 cell. And there are plenty of other V1 cells. There aren't just ones for vertical lines. There are other V1 cells that want a line that exact, exactly 45 degrees angled from bottom left to upper right. And then there are other ones that only respond to horizontal lines and all sorts of other tilts and things like that. So it's not like there's only one that they look out for. It's just that each V1 cell is very specific to one kind of line tilt. But it's more than just tilting the lines around. There are um, some really picky aspects of it. So if we're looking at a simple V1 cell, that's the one we've been looking at so far. That really requires the line to be in the correct tilt and the correct location, and also needs to be the correct size. So as long as all those are satisfied, then it's going to respond to it. And that's depicted by the situation here. If the line is uh, too moved up to the left and uh, up, then it won't respond to it. If it falls perfectly within the gray box here, then it will respond best to it. If we move it down to the right, then it stops responding. If we tilt the line, it stops responding. There are other things that these V1 simple cells talk to that are complex cells. So they're the next step up in the chain. These complex cells have a little bit more flexibility because they get inputs from multiple of these V1 cells. So there might be a one V1 cell that says, okay, uh, I'll respond to the line as long as it falls here, the first scenario. Another V1 cell will say, well, I only respond as long as it's in the middle of the gray box. And yet another V1 cell will respond as long as it falls toward the bottom edge of the gray box. And so if, this, if one complex cell receives inputs from all three of these V1 cells, if any of them fire, then the complex cell will say, okay, that's good. Um, I've got my line. And so that explains why 
the complex cell in this case will respond to all three of these scenarios because all three of these simple cells, uh, each one will respond to a different situation. But as long as any of them respond to that, then this complex cell will basically also fire. So it just requires any one of the simple cells that are tied to it to be set off by this specific line tilt and location scenario. And of course, there's another uh, step up in the chain. Hypercomplex cells will factor in things like length as well, uh, length and width of these lines. So kind of illustrating this a bit, we'll have, for instance, a simple cell where if we have it in the perfect location and the perfect tilt and the perfect size, it'll respond the best it can to that. And if we start moving it around within a, an area, the simple cell won't like that. It requires a very specific location along with the tilt and size. The complex cell will still respond to it as long as it has the right tilt and size, even if it falls any part in this gray uh, zone here, because other simple cells will be setting it off, basically. There will be a different simple cell that says, yes, I want it to be right here. And that'll be enough for the complex cell that receives multiple simple cell inputs to say, yeah, this is good for me. But we see that the complex cell doesn't like it when we start tilting in the weird direction. Hypercomplex cells, as we see below, start factoring in things like uh, the length of the line and maybe the width of the line. And so we see that they have a very specific response for those two. And as for illustrating exactly how all this matches up, that part I mentioned before about the center versus surround stuff happening with the retinal ganglion cells. Imagine that the illustration we have here with the blue circles and the red line going through it are four retinal ganglion cells. Um, perhaps a little bit more since we have more blue circles than that. So we'll say that there are a bunch of retinal ganglion cells and they're arranged, they happen to be um, next to each other in this diagonal line. And so each red plus represents the center on of that retinal ganglion cell. Each blue disc re represents the surround off of that retinal ganglion cell. As long as they're all arranged in this order, they then send their inputs up to the LGN and the LGN just forwards that up to this V1 simple cell. So as long as all these retinal ganglion cells basically are activating to what is basically a line or a bunch of dots that form a line, in this diagonal kind of shape, then it'll get this V1 cell to fire. If the line is tilted in a weird way that isn't perfectly diagonal like this in this direction, or if we move the line to a different location, then that line falls into the surround areas of these retinal ganglion cells, and it doesn't like it as much, and there's going to be less signaling to this V1 simple cell. So that explains like the wiring setup for why these V1 simple cells only fire to very specific line characteristics, like a specific tilt, specific location, specific size. As far as what happens later up on the chain though, we see that there are different simple cells that respond to the same tilt of line as long as it's in its own specific location. So we'll see this, uh, this one all the way to the right, this uh, rightmost simple cell, this will respond to the first red band here. The middle simple cell will respond to the second red band here, and this other simple cell will respond to the third red band here. Basically, if any one of these becomes activated by a stimulus, it'll set off the complex cell. So this is why the complex cell becomes less discriminating about the exact location of the line, as long as the line has the correct tilt, because the correct tilt is still required by all of these simple cells here. And another complicated diagram. One of the other aspects behind what's happening within V1 is that we got these different columns of cells in there. Uh, we're not gonna worry about ocular dominance columns here. That's a little bit more technical than what I care about here. But you'll notice it's a little bit harder to see, but more important, it says orientation columns. So if we were to take a chunk out of V1 here, just take it out and then look at it under a microscope, there are columns that respond to different tilts of lines. So this column that is, let's say, in the center here, prefers only horizontal lines. So all the cells in this column will respond to horizontal lines. They might do it to different locations in the visual scene, but they only want horizontal lines. 
we go to the neighboring columns and we see the line tilts change as far as what the preference is. So if we go to maybe the third column over from the left, and we see that, oh, well, we need a line that tilts maybe about uh, 15 to 30 degrees or something. And it will fire best to that. All the cells in that column will fire best to this line of a specific tilt. So we actually have this, this orientation preference arranged like a map within the back of our brain, within this primary visual cortex. We basically have a map of line tilts or preferred line tilts that the brain is starting to reconstruct in this brain area. And kind of also illustrating the same idea, if we were to put an electrode through the brain, but instead of going straight down, we just put it horizontally across the brain, just cutting through column by column, we could graph the responses to what each neuron responds best to. And so the best response for a neuron is illustrated by one dot. So this neuron over here prefers a line that's at um, negative 70-ish degree tilt. This neuron here, negative 65. This neuron over here uh, prefers negative 50 or so, so on and so forth. So as we are moving through the orientation columns, we see that the line preference, uh, the line tilt preference changes. And it will kind of do a switcheroo and go back and up and so on. And so that's what's happening when they say electrode track, because we're going through each column and seeing how the line preference changes, giving us a map of line preferences. Okay. So that ends it. And I know that that's sort of a complicated part. Um, it might seem kind of weird. It's like, why is our vision just trying to detect a bunch of lines? It is doing this because there are other visual areas that finally take these lines and start putting them together into things that we recognize. Things like triangles or uh, things like squares or hexagons and other things that my hands can't do. Um, so our vision is constructive. What we see with our eyes is not exactly what our brain sees. And part of that is because the construction has some incompleteness to it. The other part of it is that the brain takes shortcuts in trying to fill in information quickly rather than waiting for it to build all the Legos back up into a recognizable structure. So we'll see that in the visual perception portion of the class where we see how the brain takes shortcuts and why it takes shortcuts. Key point being when we recognize objects that aren't there. So when we see a face in a piece of toast or a face in a cloud or an animal shape in a cloud or other things like that, when we falsely recognize things, that's because our brain is taking shortcuts to help us detect things faster. But sometimes there are false positives when it tries to do that. And again, we'll talk about the, the ins and outs of how that works. So the construction starts here at V1, putting lines together into shapes. And then it can start to influence the idea of recognizing familiar things after that.